I'm going to speak just for a few moments here tonight, and uh, I'm going to speak on the topic, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? And just before we, I begin to unpack this, if we can just uh, lift up our hands one more time, just ask God to have his hand upon this service. Lord, we are so thankful, God, to be in your house once again. Lord, we never take it lightly when we get to come into your house, Lord, and Lord, hear your word, Jesus, and sing songs that glorify you. We pray right now that you would allow your hand to rest upon the remainder part of the service. Anoint your servant here tonight as I preach your word, Lord. I pray that your hand would rest upon this service in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Just, uh, this is something that I've been working on for a little while, and hopefully I can bring it across in a way that makes sense to everyone. Um, First of all, uh, I was listening to a Christian comedian by the name of Tim, Tim Hawkins. You may have heard tell of him. And uh, he had stated how he wondered how people came up with the murals and nursery rooms in churches across North America. He was saying that, uh, you know, the time that God drowned everyone and uh, everything on the face of the earth except for eight people. Why don't we just paint that as a mural in our nursery room? <laughs> You know, and you have these stories that we've somehow uh, jam-packed and tried to, to put them up like that. And we're going to put that on the wall in the nursery room. And he makes a joke about how desensitized we have made some of the Bible stories. But whether he's right or not, one of the stories that has become a children's story is that of David and Goliath. And oftentimes we use this analogy to prove that even a young person can bring about victory when faced with life's giants. There is nothing wrong with that, but we cannot, what we cannot do is lose the message God was trying to send through a humble shepherd boy. One of Levi's favorite songs lately is, uh, has been this children's song. It's titled, Only a Boy Named David. <laughs> And he has been asking that to be on repeat over and over and over again. So, in fact, on our way home today from Perth, um, we listened to it many, many times. The only other thing that is tested and sure besides the Word of God is a parent's patience on a road trip. <laughs> and uh, let me give you a little bit of background on David, first of all. David was the youngest of eight sons of Jesse. Three of his brothers served in Saul's army. Their names were Eliab, who was the firstborn, Abinadab, and Shammah. And they were the three oldest of Jesse's sons. Every now and again, David would leave his father's sheep, which he tended to go visit with his brothers in the military camps. One day, David's father, Jesse, he called his young son and dispatched him on a very important errand. David was instructed to take for his brothers some food, an ephah of dried grain, we see in the Bible in 10 loaves of bread. And he was also instructed to take 10 cheeses to the captains of Saul's army in return for information on how his brothers were faring. Goliath was a champion of the Philistines who rose up at a time when the armies of Saul were arrayed against the armies of the Philistines to do battle. He was a huge man. The Bible tells us that he was 9 feet 9 inches tall and he wore tremendous armor. The weight of his coat of mail alone was 125 pounds. 125 pounds. Now, that's a heavy coat. Usually when we're going coat shopping, we try to find something light, lighter than 125 pounds. And his iron spearhead was about 15 pounds in weight. And in addition to that, Goliath wore a bronze helmet on his head, bronze armor on his legs, and carried a bronze javelin on his back. He also carried a spear, a sword, and a shield bearer carried a shield. And Goliath, the champion of the Philistines, he struck fear in the heart of the children of Israel. Both armies were gathered at a place called such a, and a place, this was a place that belonged to Judah. This was a place that belonged to the children of God. And in other words, the children of Israel were on their own home turf. And every day for 40 days, morning and evening, Goliath would stand up and defy the armies of Israel. He would challenge them to send out a champion to fight with him. He said to them, if he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. 
But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And of course, he always thought that the latter would take place. He was intimidating. Did you know that one of the devil's main devices is intimidation? In our day and time, he is trying to intimidate believers, to try to keep us quiet, to keep us in our place. As long as we just stay where we're at, as long as we don't proceed any farther, as long as we don't gain any more territory, as long as we don't advance, then he's doing his job. Saul and his army knew that they did not have a man to match Goliath's size and strength, so they were dismayed. And greatly afraid, the Bible tells us. The word, the one word that could be used to describe the response of the Israelites is fearful. They were afraid. To put it bluntly, they were shaking in their boots. That is what the Bible says in verse 11 and 24. If I'm reading it correctly, fear is a very powerful thing. It says not only were they afraid, but verse 11 says that they were greatly afraid. And verse 24 says that they were sore afraid. Now, one of my happiest moments in life was when my family and I went to Sandspit and my in-laws met us there. My father-in-law and my mother-in-law, we got there and we were having a great time, Sandspit PEI. And uh, my mother-in-law had never been on a roller coaster before in her life, never. So my entire objective that day was then to get her on the roller coaster with me. And oh, the joy that I had when I finally got her on the roller coaster and you heard every tick, you heard every, uh, every little squeal that that thing made. And on top of all of that was the screaming. <laughs> When we went around the corner and then down and then looped around and came back. And, uh, you know, it was exciting for me. It, it was really exciting. But I remember after we got off of that, she looked at me and she said, I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> you know, because for her, even doing it did not relieve her of the fear that she had of being on it. You know, so... <clears throat> It didn't, it, it didn't do anything for her, but it did a lot for me. <laughs> at, uh, you know, at one time, King Saul had stood head and shoulders above Israel. And, but now he was a shell of what he had been. He had been praised by women of Israel for slaying thousands of Israel's enemies. But now he can scarcely be coaxed out of his tent. We know that because of his disobedience, the Spirit of the Lord was no longer upon him. And instead of leading the people of God to victory, he sees no problem in sending David to his death. What was supposed to be just a sure thing, as long as you follow the Lord, as long as you follow God, as long as you keep him first, you'll never have any trouble. Now, there had gone out from Saul a decree that if any man accepted the challenge and killed Goliath, he would become a rich man in addition to having the king's daughter as his wife and would be exempt from paying taxes. And uh, it would be quite a prize for, for anyone brave enough to take up the Philistines' challenge. And unfortunately, no one was willing to do so. No one except for David. The real problem for them was their faithlessness. Their faithlessness was the source of their fearfulness. They did not fear God as they ought, so this put them at the mercy of their enemy. They were walking by sight and not by faith. Listen to their question in verse 25. They say, have ye seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel he has come up. Their own faithlessness and distrust of God had backed them into a corner. They began to examine the magnitude of their dilemma. They began to step back and see the size of what they were dealing with. Have you seen? Who hasn't been in that place before that we've asked that question? Have you seen what I'm going through? Have you seen where I'm at? Have you seen what I'm up against? You wouldn't understand where I'm coming from. The preacher isn't talking to me. I am exempt from having faith in God in this situation because, well, it's, it's hard. It is said that when 
British and French were fighting in Canada in the 1750s. Admiral Phipps, commander of the British fleet, was told to anchor outside of Quebec. And he was given orders to wait for the British land forces to arrive and then support them when they attacked the city. In Phipps' navy, they arrived early. As the admiral waited, he became annoyed by the statues of the saints that adorned the towers of the nearby cathedral. So he commanded his men to shoot at them with the ship's cannons. No one knows how many rounds were fired or how many statues were knocked out. But when the land forces arrived and the signal was given to attack, the admirable was of no help at all. He had used up all of his ammunition shooting at the saints. We can become so consumed with where we are at in life that we begin taking out our frustrations on adversaries instead of enemies. The ones who have our back and stand by our side are some, sometimes the ones that get the blunt of our wrath when we are backed into a corner. I know that this isn't something that we talk about a whole lot. Pastor spoke on Sunday evening and said that if we are not careful, we'll begin to believe more so of what is said on mainstream media and social media than what is preached from behind the pulpit from the man of God that God has called a commission to speak into your life. You can get so caught up on YouTube videos and Netflix shows and things like that that have documentaries and docuseries about the Word of God and believe that than the actual Word of God itself. Pastor and Sister Carter, my, my wife and I, brother and sister Beckerton are not out to get anyone, I can assure you of that. But the frustrations that sometimes we as saints of God feel with the pressures of the enemy attempting to stake his claim in our own backyard can lead us to think that everyone is out to get us, including those God purposed in your life for your good. Can I take it a step further and say that you are not warring against your spouse or your children? We're not warring against each other. We're in this together. This is the family of God. Ephesians chapter 6, it tells us, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We are not wrestling against each other. On the night of September 21st, the army of Austria, approximately, this was in 1778, uh, the army of Austria, approximately 100,000 strong, was setting up camp around the town of, I'm going to get the name wrong, Karen, Karen Sabis, something like that. I can't, I can't pronounce it. The army's vanguard crossed the river nearby to scout for the presence of the, of the Turks. There were no sign of the Ottoman army, but the vanguard did run into a group of gypsies who offered to sell alcohol to the war-weary soldiers. The cavalrymen bought the alcohol and started a drink. Soon afterwards, some infantry, they crossed the river. When they saw the party going on, the infantry demanded alcohol for themselves, and the vanguard uh, refused to give them any of it. So, well, they were still drunk. They set up makeshift fortifications around the barrels, and a heated argument ensued. And one soldier, one soldier, that's all it took, one soldier to fire her shot. And then it all broke loose. That's all it took. It was one shot. It wasn't everyone firing at once at the same time. It wasn't a bunch of things going on. All it took was one little thing to take place. And immediately, the vanguard and infantry engaged in combat with one, one, with one another. They began fighting one another. An army that stood 100,000 men strong began fighting each other over something that wasn't anything to do with the war at hand. Wasn't anything to do with the enemy. And during the conflict, some infantry began shouting, Turks, Turks. The army fled the scene, thinking that the Ottoman army's attack was imminent. Most of the infantry also ran away. The army comprised of Austrian, Serbs, Croats, and Italians from Lombardy, plus some other minorities. But the real complexing issue that happened with all of this is that they could not understand each other. There was a language barrier that was taking place here, and while it was not clear which one of the groups did so, they gave the false warning without telling the others, who promptly began to flee. Some began to fire at each other, some began to flee. 
And the situation was made worse when officers, in an attempt to restore order, shouted, Halt! Halt! Which was misheard by soldiers with no knowledge of German as Allah, Allah. As the cavalrymen ran through the camps, a commander reasoned that it was a cavalry charge by the Ottoman army and ordered artillery fire. Meanwhile, the entire camp awoke to the sound of battle, and rather than waiting to see what the situation was, everyone fled. Hundreds upon hundreds of men lost their lives. Thousands were wounded. The troops fired at every shadow, thinking that the Ottomans were everywhere. In reality, they were shooting fellow Austrian soldiers. The incident escalated to the point where the whole army retreated from the imaginary enemy that they had created. Two days later, the Ottoman army arrived. They discovered dead and wounded soldiers and easily took the city for themselves. We cannot afford to open fire on each other because of things that have happened, because it is in those instances the enemy will come in and walk to victory while he steps over our graves. On the day that David arrived at the camp, the children of Israel were getting ready to fight with the Philistine army, or at least in their minds, they were going to attempt at some point, possibly, maybe. David, he handed over the food that had been brought to the supply keeper and then ran over to greet his brothers. As he stood talking to them, Goliath showed up and repeated his defiant words. But this time, David heard them. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? He exclaimed. Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard David's remarks and he got angry. Why did you come down here, he said. He got upset at David for asking any questions at all. Who do you think you are coming in here? We've been the ones fighting this battle, and you just come waltzing in and think you're going to say something about it? And he said, and with whom have you left those sheep, those few sheep in the wilderness? In other words, aren't you just a shepherd boy? Shouldn't you be off caring for the sheep while us men are here taking care of the battle? And as he stood there talking to them. Eliab, he began to berate his little brother. I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. But David responded with a bit of attitude. What have I done now? And then he responds with this. Is there not a cause? In other words, is there not a time to take a stand? Is there not a truth worth living for? Indeed, worth dying for, if necessary. No doubt there are giants stuck in the land. Just like Goliath. They are waving their arms and defying the God that we serve. I would like to ask the same question that David asked his brothers on that day. Is there not a cause? David told the king, I will fight him. I'll do it. I just love David's courage. All these military are, are hiding behind rocks. David, he leaves the sheep on an errand from his father and says, I'll do it. And he attempts to approach the king and tell the king, I will fight him. And David, you know, the, the king it gives him some, some armor and he says, no, I'm not going to wear that. It's untested. David, he got a sling and five smooth stones out of a brook and went onto the battlefield with Goliath. And Goliath, he just thought that this was a joke. He's like, oh, good one. Good one, Phil, you know, good one, Israelites. This is hilarious. Yeah, who do you think I am? Sometimes the enemy will make you feel like you're a joke. But God is on your side. He proves the impossible to be the possible. He makes a way where there is no way. Amen. And notice the utter disdain and disregard that Goliath has for David. He takes it as a personal insult that Israel would send out a champion, champion, like this young shepherd boy. But there is more than meets the eye. Goliath, he curses David by his gods, the Bible tells us, and boasts that he would feed David's flesh to the birds and the beasts. Satan works in much the same way. He seeks to intimidate us and humiliate us. 
He is a liar, a deceiver, and a murderer. He cannot be trusted, but there is someone who can be trusted. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 45, we see this start to unfold. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not say with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give it you into our hands. David, he walked towards Goliath, armed with nothing but a leather sling and five smooth stones. As his brothers watched from behind boulders, and the Philistines scoffed and laughed, David swung his sling around and around as he advanced towards the giant. He let go of the rock and the sling and hit Goliath, and that towering giant fell to the ground. David rushed over and took Goliath's sword and cut off his head. It's probably the part that they leave out when they're telling it downstairs. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled in panic. And the Hebrews pursued them to their cities. The Jewish historian Josephus, he declared that 30,000 Philistines were killed and 60,000 wounded in that route. Goliath's head was taken as a trophy to Jerusalem, and his sword eventually found its way into the tabernacle. No matter how tall, how scary that giant looks in front of you, stand tall and trust in God. David's goal was clear. Verse 47 says that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. It really wasn't the simple weapons that David used that brought Goliath down. Rather, it was his faith. So I ask you the question today, is there not a cause? If we could all stand as I begin to come to a close here. The Lord has not given his church a spirit of fearfulness. When he said he was going to prepare a place for us so that where he is, there we may be also, and that he would not leave us comfortless, he did not say that he was going to send us a spirit of fear to keep us on our toes. But rather, he said that he was going to send us his spirit, the comforter. So I say to you here tonight, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Yes, there is a cause. Everyone has something to contribute. It's easy, it may be easy to stand on the sidelines like the Israelites did that day and stare down the enemy and say it's, it's too large for us to conquer. We can't do it. But all it takes is someone willing to stand up and say, I'll do it. There is a cause. Not everyone can be on the front lines, but everyone can contribute to the effort. Jesse was too aged to fight, but he was interested in the cause nonetheless. He did what he could. He supplied nourishment for his sons and their captain. He encouraged those in the battle with such resources as he had. Not everyone can teach publicly. Not everyone can preach. Not everyone can sing or play music. But everyone has something to contribute. Everyone can make a friend and disciple them to Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27, it says, But God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Maybe you feel like you don't have anything to contribute to the cause of Christ. Or you simply don't know where you fit in. But that there is a ministry God has for you to do. But God uses people and things that we would never think of to bring about his purpose and plan. They didn't think that day that it would be a small shepherd boy that would come, just bringing some refreshments, just bringing some stuff. What's going on, guys? Why are we hiding? Why are we hiding? Well, there's an adversary. Have you seen this man? Don't you come down here and tell us all about this battle. Have you seen what's going on? 
no, this isn't the way that it's going to be. Is there not a cause? Is there not a truth that we have to uphold? Is there not this word of God that we've got to get out there and we've got to share? Is there not a purpose and a plan for each and every one of us to be used in the body of Christ? I know that I might have taken us down a few rabbit trails here tonight, and this is sort of just something that I've been working on, something that I've been unpacking. And, and uh, as I prayed about this this afternoon, I just prayed that God would allow his hand to rest upon this service in such a way that it would not just be words spoken, but that it would actually touch someone's heart. I pray that if there is somebody in here that is going through frustrations, that you would not take your frustrations out on those around you that love and care for you, but rather turn it all to God. It's not God giving you any fear over your situation. It's not God making you feel intimidated. It's the adversary. It's, it's the enemy, rather. And we have this wonderful thing called the family of God. Aren't you thankful for it? I absolutely love watching, and I'll just miss in just a minute. I know you're, you're all standing, and I appreciate that. But I, I love watching as we all gather together. But what I love even more than that is when we worship together, we get together at this altar, and we begin praying for each other. And then afterwards, we all talk with each other get together, we chat, and nobody's in a rush to get out of here. Nobody's bolting it for the door because they don't want to talk to so-and-so or they don't want to get caught in the corner by who, whoever. But we're all gathering together as a family of God, and we're just communing with one another. We're talking with one another. And I think what is so powerful is that we know we have each other's back, is that we're not going it alone, that we're not going it on the battlefield with without a supporting army in behind us. That we're not facing this life full of mountains and valleys and challenges in front of us without knowing that we have people that lock arm in arm with us and say, let's do this. David didn't have to go on the battlefield alone. We commemorate him for that. We think that it's wonderful that such a young boy will go out and do something so commendable. We think that that's just awesome, but the reality of it is, is that he didn't have to go it alone, and we don't have to either. Hey, Amen. Can we just worship the Lord one, one more time here before we leave? God, we thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for the family of God. Lord, we thank you, Jesus, for this body of believers, oh God, that joined together, Lord, not just on Sundays, on Wednesdays, oh God, but all throughout the week. Lord, I pray right now, Jesus, that you would allow this word to be an encouragement to each and every one, God, and that you would allow us, Jesus, to see Lord, that we are not alone in any circumstance that we have, God, no matter how desperate it may seem, Lord, no matter how bleak our circumstances are, God, but that we can lock arms with one another, God, create prayer partners, Lord, in our situations with the family of God. Hallelujah, Jesus, and reach heaven together. Lord, we pray right now that you would have your hand upon each and every one. Lord, I pray, Jesus, that you would let your word, Jesus, begin to resonate with each one here tonight. Hallelujah, God. I thank you for your presence that I feel right now, Lord. I thank you, O oh God, for ministering this word to us here tonight, Jesus. Allow your hand to rest upon each one as we go our separate ways. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. And God bless you. Thank you so much for coming to the house of the Lord here tonight.